Welcome everybody. This is uh, a Software Equity Group's second uh, virtual coffee with SEG. Um, today, I'm really excited to invite Fred Sturgis uh, to participate. Fred is the uh, one of the founders of Resurgence Technology Partners, and uh, you know I've had the good fortune of knowing Fred for a number of years. So, Fred, welcome. I hope you have your cup of coffee with you today. Thanks Cheers. for having me, Alan. It's great to be here. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. What's, uh, what's up with the helmet that's sitting there behind you? That's a Furman Paladin helmet, a stalwart of 1AA Southern Conference football, where, where both I and Adi Filipovic, my, my co-founder, both played. Oh, good for you. Good for yeah. you. So, um, you know, I've had, the, I've had the good fortune of working with, with Fred and team. Um, and uh, last, late last year, we closed Office Space. Um, and uh, you know, the experience was terrific. Uh, the feedback that I've been receiving from my former client has been terrific. Um, you guys, you guys have really built a firm that uh, is definitely uh, best practice in the sectors that it's serving and has just a culture that I, I believe is just truly remarkable. So congratulations on what you've built. Uh, maybe you can just provide a quick background, Fred, on yourself and then we'll get going. Yeah, I'll try to be brief, and thank you so much for saying that. It means a lot to us, um, especially coming from you. We So we are a, a, a few things about resurgence, small software buyout focus. We have a $200 million fund. We're really focused on companies, recurring revenue software businesses that are in the five to $20 million revenue range. It's kind of a broad range, but you know, it's a reflective of the different kind of business models. Um, I guess a couple things about, you know, we've, we're a blend of investor and operating backgrounds, and that'll continue to be the case, you know, as we build our firm, it's kind of a, a, a foundational, you know, premise of the firm. Um, and I think that what, you know, we, we'd like to, we're, we're pitching right now is that we're pretty experienced investors and, and we're new, right? So we're entrepreneurial, we've got a new fund, it's, it's um, you know, we got a lot of time and attention that we can spend with, with these early investments. Um, how I got here, we started the firm in 2016, and, and in reverse uh, chronological order, I was at Excel KKR, at, uh, building a small buyout effort for them. I was at HIG Capital for a bunch of years, and I was a tech investment banker and, and consultant way back in the day. Yeah, so you've got some great experience. Um, so, you know, in uh, I think you're familiar with this. In late March, Software Equity Group, we surveyed about 50 private equity firms. And we also surveyed about 25 strategic buyers just to get their feel on what's happening in the marketplace. And um, you know, now we have the, the benefit of a couple months uh, under our belt. Uh, we've seen the stock market improve. The NASDAQ, if I'm not mistaken, is off somewhere in the neighborhood of 9% from its peak in February. Um, for us as an M&A advisory, clearly, uh, March was an interesting time. Um, you know, the clients definitely put the brakes on things. Uh, buyers definitely put the brakes on things as they were assessing the market. But come April, we were right back at it. Um, we were very fortunate that we had, I believe, the right companies that we were working with in the right markets and industries that were showing, you know, strong retention as well as good and strong revenue growth. Uh, maybe not as strong as what they would have had some of them actually have, was a bit stronger. Um, so that being said, what what's changed for you? What have, what's different today uh, versus where we, we were where we were in in late March? Yeah, I think it, we've had a similar experience. So I think that first of all, everybody was very focused on their portfolio, and there was a lot of uncertainty, you know, around what the what the implications might be and how immediate they might they may be. I mean, I think if, if our portfolio is indicative of the market, you know, more broadly, we're 90% recurring revenue for companies, you know, um, really kind of no, not selling into any directly impacted segments, thankfully. And so, I mean, I think that we have been, we've been nothing but pleasantly surprised. I mean, we, we started, you know, back in a few weeks ago, there was a lot of chatter around kind of, uh, and we talked to other private equity firms, kind of a 50% of bookings expectation for Q2. I mean, that was sort of a prevailing starting point. And I think that since then, we've been nothing but pleasantly surprised. You know, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of erosion in, at all on the, on the retention side. We've had a few companies come back and ask for price breaks or, you know, deferment of, sure. of renewals and such, but it's a very, very small minority. And, 
And I think we're going to get closer to a hundred percent when you know, not everybody's going to hit the bookings plan, but it's not going to be 50% either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's refreshing to hear. Uh, so what would you tell a SAS executive owner that was thinking about running a process for maybe a full sale or majority re re uh, majority recap prior to COVID-19? What, what advice would you give that person now? Yeah, I think I would say to to consider a um, a more targeted kind of outreach and more of a, a have more time to make deeper connections with a smaller number of people um, because it would probably take that you know at least right now. I mean, maybe things will loosen up dramatically in the coming couple of months, but it, assuming that that's a slow kind of recovery back to normalcy, I think going deeper, you know, with a smaller number of people is, is a smart strategy. And, you know, I think that the, the uh, acclimate yourself potentially to the idea that it might be a pretty good time to, to think about an overweighting your reinvestment, you know, kind of element. I mean, just both for financial reasons, if you, if you think it's, it's a better time to sell maybe in the future than it is on the margin today, um, and also because I think there will be some sentiment, you know, from certain investors that will like that dynamic, right? They'll like the idea of risk sharing, you know, gain sharing with, with, with their founder partners. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about the intimate nature, smaller processes. That's some of the things that we've been doing. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is not being able to sit down across the table from a prospective uh, seller. Uh, we've tried to address that by having more virtual meetings, by setting up virtual coffees, by setting up virtual happy hours with prospective, uh, with our clients uh, and prospective buyers. Um, you know, what, what else have you seen uh, in, in that regard? Yeah, our perspective on this from the beginning was a little bit counter, you know, because the people that I talked to, there was a lot of sentiment about like, no way, no how would we consider investing and until we have that dinner, you know what I mean? Like there's something about that dinner. We got to get, we got to check that box. And, you know, I think our view was, look, if you, to me, the biggest, um, the, if you think about underwriting risk, I mean, so many of these processes have gotten so scripted and so, so short, you know, in duration and that the aggregate amount of diligence you could actually do on an investment was was contracting dramatically, especially at the higher end of the market. But, you know, we, we sort of said, look, if we get the time to do more work and be more methodical and not feeling like we're cutting any corners from a diligence standpoint, we could, that's a pretty good trade in terms of, you know, the two hour dinner, you know? So while we would all like to, not only from a buying perspective, from a selling perspective, I want people to meet us, you know, as, as part of the process, but we, we felt like you could compensate for that, you know, with more, more better diligence. Yeah. I can appreciate that. Clearly one of your guys' big differentiators is who you are as people. And, um, you know, that's hard to replicate virtually, but, but it can be done. And eventually, obviously we'll get back to, to what we, I believe is, is normal. We may all be traveling and meeting with masks on, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, but we'll get there. Uh, so talk about an attractive uh, prospect today. Um, maybe what are, the, what are the top three things, four things you look at when something comes across your desk and it's a company that's a SaaS business that's in that five to 30 million revenue range. What do you say to the team? Hey, one, two, three, and four, they got to have this. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's interesting. I mean, it's definitely changed uh, on the margin relative to the environment that we're in, but not, not dramatically. You know I mean? It's not like we're waking up and saying, Hey, like we got to go point ourselves at different businesses or different business models. I mean, I think that the order of the day is really durability. I mean, it's maybe a little bit of an overused term, but it's important to us. You know, I think that the, um, retention rate and feeling rock solid about that. I do think profitability, you know, on the margin, like we'd skew more for towards things that, that have proven profitability models and therefore, you know, the capital risk dynamic is, is even less pronounced. Um, and I also think like on balance, we would probably prefer a little bit more scale versus less so with a little more 20 a little less five right at the moment you know um we're not really 
we would trade all those things off for growth. I mean, I guess that the, um, the hardest thing I think to forecast in, in, in this kind of an uncertain environment is growth trajectory, right? And so if you're really kind of reliant on, on a fast growing underwriting, you know, whether it's, it's because of the, the, what you're paying for the business or, you know, what you need for, for it to work from an underwriting standpoint, that's harder, you know, I think, but if you're more of a blocking and tackling style investor where you're kind of, it's organic, it's inorganic, you know, you could argue, and you know this, I mean, and, you know, it could be a really good time to do add on acquisitions, you know, I mean, and, and so we look at it as kind of a, a mitigant, you know, to what is admittedly a, a uncertainty around the growth rate. But I don't think that much uncertainty around everything else. I don't think it's as uncertain as people might fear it is. Mm -hmm. What about 2020 projections and expectations there or forgiveness there for that matter? Yeah, <laughs> forgiveness. Is good. I saw the first presentation um, last week that I really liked, which kind of it, it, the first one that kind of had a pre-COVID, post-COVID, you know, project, like a discrete sort of um, uh, forecast and which you really kind of, what it really, the story it really told was that the business was like a year, it was a year delayed, right? In terms of the level of scale, they were, they were projecting to get to the level of scale next year that they had originally had, had hoped they might this year. And I think that that was a kind of an interesting way for us to think about it, you know, sort of like, okay, what's the cost of waiting a year, you know, to get to that level of scale? I mean, it's some sort of, some sort of discount rate, some sort of return requirement. Is it 20%? Is it 25%? It's maybe it's something like that, you know? So I wish you could put things in a box to that greater degree, but that was one at least framework, you know, that was helpful to us. Well, this brings up probably a dozen more questions that I'd love to ask you, Fred, but the purpose of these things is to try to keep them brief. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to move on to my last question um, okay. is, you know, what, what do you expect as far as a recovery? Uh, we've talked about uh, a V, we've talked about a U, people talk about an L. I mentioned before on these that there's this Nike swoosh comment and people are now talking about W. What's your, you, you don't have a, nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, so nobody's gonna hold this uh, against you. Uh, but wh what are your thoughts? I had not, I had not heard the Nike swoosh, but maybe just my subconscious gravitated to it, but I, I like it, you know, because I do feel like it'll be, I think I, I, I expect there to be a pretty strong, you know, snapback, but I don't expect it to be as steep. And so I think that's a great visual to think, you know, it'll be a steady uh, move back to, to where we were and, um, and I do think it'll be steady. I do think it'll be gradual. Um, I think that's a perfectly good environment to be operating in, you know, but, but I don't think we're going to wake up, you know, in Q4 and everything's going to be okay either. <laughs> you know, So I like the swoosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, SCG's virtual coffee. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Same here, Alan. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Take care. You too.